Good afternoon. It's my honor to introduce today's speaker as part of the Store Lectureship in Life Sciences. And our speaker today is Chris Field, who is, uh, has a, an, is now the Perry L. McCartney Director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment and the Melvin and Joan Lane Professor for Interdisciplinary Environmental Studies. That takes a lot of room on the letterhead, but it's well deserved. Uh, he got his undergraduate degree from Harvard University and then was a graduate student with a number of us here at uh, Stanford University. Uh, he then returned to Stanford after a, a brief hiatus and uh, was the head of a, the Global Ecology Institute at, uh, that was part of Carnegie Institution based on the Stanford campus. Uh, last year he uh, got involved with the uh, Chris, uh, the, no, Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. And today he's going to talk to you about the Jasper, Jasper Ridge Global uh, Change Experiment. One, thing I, one last thing is that if you did not hear his talk yesterday because of extenuating circumstances, it is recorded and will be available to you if you have any interest in climate change, which uh, means if you're still living and breathing, you might want to take a look at that uh, video. But for now, we're going to move more into the technical area and take it away, Chris. for not being able to manage the multiple microphones. Is it good now? Okay. Well, I, yesterday I talked about global scale issues and, and the way they connect with all of us. What I want to talk today is about a, a, a place and a very special place, Stanford's Jasper Ridge Biological Reserve. Stanford is, is really unusual, unique among major universities in having a biological reserve that's incorporated in the main campus. 1,200 acres of the 8,000 acre Stanford campus are, are a biological reserve. And it's been a, it's been a source of a wonderfully sort of creative cauldron of ideas over many decades. And Jasper Ridge is a place where the, where the concept of coevolution really got invented. It's, it's a place where the ideas that you could think about the physiology of entire ecosystems really got invented. And it's a place where um, there, the uh, sort of key ideas of climate change research, and especially with focus on impacts on ecosystems, really came together. And I want to share a, a few things about this kind of cultural and history of Jasper Ridge. At the same time, I, I provide some details of the uh, Jasper Ridge Global Change Experiment, which uh, we've been doing uh, continuously since the late 1990s. Here's a map of uh, where Jasper Ridge fits in the Stanford campus. Uh, the, the preserve is surrounded by the purple line here. And it's at the, the foothills extreme. Uh, Jasper Ridge is about 1,200 acres. And as you can see, uh, back in the 1890s, it was considered land unfit for cultivation. Or um, you know, somewhere else it says, poor land, uh, don't bother with this. But, it, but it's got a, a mix of different ecosystem types. It's, it's really um, wonderful in having small representatives. It's pretty much every ecosystem type that we have in coastal central California. It's got a little redwood forest, lots of chaparral, oak woodlands, grasslands. It's got a, a creek and riparian ecosystems. So it, it provides a, a wonderful chance to do teaching and resource, research in uh, an, an interesting array of ecosystems. But it's an array of ecosystems that's also embedded in a, in a really uh, dense urban matrix. And this is the, the watershed that feeds the creeks that come through Jasper Ridge. Jasper Ridge is here. San Francisco Bay is here. And one of the unique 
features of our environment is that the Bay Area metropolitan area really comes basically out to the edge of Shasta Ridge, and it's really embedded in an urban matrix. And a lot of the thinking in recent years has really focused more about how do you understand and manage the relationship between nature and, and development in, in the 21st century. And it's also important to recognize that even though we think about Jasper Ridge as uh, this pristine piece of nature that's been protected, it, it really has had a, a profound range of human impacts all the way from extensive management by indigenous peoples um, all the way to, uh, to this. Uh, in the 19, well, through the 1930s, uh, much of the preserve was managed as a recreational area where there was a big sand of each, there were horseback rides, uh, there were paddle boats, and uh, uh, it, tons and tons of, of recreational uses. It also is, is an area that's been intensively managed as part of Stanford's water system. Uh, there's a, a 60 foot high, 200 foot wide dam that is uh, creating a reservoir that's mostly now filled with sediment and it's been ground zero for a lot of recent questions about how to, how to find the right balance between uh, restoration activities, conservation activities, and flood protection for people downstairs. In, in all of the dams in this size category that have been removed or restored, there's never been a single one that, that was associated with such a large number of downstream people who are at risk of flooding should something happen with the, with the dam or watershed. And one of the most exciting processes that I've been involved in in, in any university was the process over the last five years to try and come up with a, a series of intelligent proposals about things that might be done with Searsville Dam and Reservoir to enhance the habitat quality, to provide um, suitable habitat for the rare and endangered species, especially steelhead that are associated with the creek, at the same time providing the water resources that Stanford needs to cut down on Stanford's draw of Hetch Hetchy water and to uh, control the flooding of the downstream populations. And one of the most interesting features of the whole conversation was that it really transitioned from an emphasis on, well, who are going to be the winners and who are going to be the losers in this process to are there things we can do that make everybody a winner? And it was, it was really inspirational to see the extent to which everybody could be uh, a winner. We haven't, now we just need to get the money in order to do the things that are in the plan. Uh, but, uh, a couple of other interesting features of, the, of Jasper Ridge is that it's been widely used by UC Davis researchers. There's a couple of pictures here. Um, Stephanie Porter worked with Kevin Rice on um, uh, nitrogen fixation, especially in these uh, in the uh, high, high nickel concentration serpentine soils. Uh, Susan Houston's had a number of projects here. Uh, uh, Mariago Garcia is working on um, uh, analysis of the way that uh, LIDAR returns of vegetation uh, provide different information for vegetation of, of different heights. The, the one final thing I want to talk about in terms of the interface between uh, urban and wildland areas is, uh, is something that is, is really important and has really changed the culture of Jasper Ridge. And it has to do with the fact that in the last several years, we've had a dramatic increase in the awareness that we're sharing the habitat with uh, important big animals like these pumas. and as uh, and, and as Eric knows, it, it's really hard to figure out how to create an environment in which um, the, the habitat's safe for the animals and it's safe for the researchers. Uh, that particular video was taken by a camera that was set up to um, record pollinator visits to flowers that were, uh, they're sort of pollinators, that, that were set up to record pollinator visits to, um, to um, an under, for an undergraduate project that was being visited uh, just about a half hour uh, after, the, after the Puma walked by. Okay, uh, with, with that as background, I, I want to introduce you to the motivation for the Jasper Ridge Global Change Experiment. And what we really tried to do at Jasper Ridge was not understand the impacts of climate change on Jasper Ridge ecosystems, but understand the impacts of climate change on 
global ecosystems, recognizing that uh, throughout the life sciences, it's been incredibly empowering for people to create, analyze, and take advantage of, of model systems. And model systems range from um, E. coli for looking at uh, molecular biology to C. elegans or, or Drosophila for looking at development to Arabidopsis for looking at plant molecular biology. And we're really still at kind of the early stages of using entire ecosystems as model systems where we pick a system that's as simple as possible but still gives us access to the full range of, of relevant mechanisms that apply uh, to tropical forest or, or, or boreal tundra. And so what we were interested in with Jasper Ridge is the fact that the plants have small stature so that you can study tens of thousands of plants in a single square meter. Most of the plants are annual so that we could go through many generations, look at population dynamics components, a replacement dynamics as well as physiological changes. High functional diversity and even though most of the plants are herbaceous, they're not entirely herbaceous, but they're deeply rooted species, shallowly rooted species, early maturing, late maturing, uh, nitrogen fixers, non-nitrogen fixers, of a wide range of functional types. Uh, they're, they're frequent disturbance. One of the things that we were really aware of when we set up the experiment is that when you, when you modify conditions to create an experiment, you often create uh, very different effects. With forest climate change experiments, it was so clear that just digging in the forest changed, the, especially the nutrient dynamics over a very long period of time, that it was really hard to get a feel for what the underlying processes were. And then an additional feature that we started working on in Jasper Ridge is because it's right on the San Andreas Fault, we have these dramatic contrasts between soils with a, a low fertility serpentine soil uh, adjacent to much higher fertility sandstone soils and the, the, we could access both those soil types within, within just a few meters. And an additional benefit of being able to work in this kind of a system is that we could recreate important components of it in these deep pots that we call mesocosms and allowed us to dramatically expand the set of nutrient availability and species mixes and allowed us to ask uh, targeted questions. The, the first phase of our climate change research at Jasper Ridge was focused on CO2 responses. It was during the 1990s and um, with a mix of these uh, field experiments and the experiments of the mesocosms, we, we found a, a bunch of things that sort of set the stage for the research to follow. And, in, and a couple of ones that I want to highlight is that there were relatively small effects of elevated C, CO2 on, on net primary production. The plants were limited by other things and, and we didn't see a, a, a strong growth effect. It's really important in the mid 90s because that was the period when people were talking about CO2 and the greening of planet Earth and the idea that we didn't need to tackle climate change because increased plant growth would tackle it for us. Um, we also found compelling evidence for the um, uh, acceleration of carbon cycling. It was faster fixation of CO2 in photosynthesis, but faster release and respiration. Uh, w one of the most uh, interesting and compelling and long-term satisfying aspects of this experiment was the number of great people who, who came through. And uh, for those of you who are into who's who and ecologists, the experiment was co-led by Terry Chapin, uh, Pep Cannadale from the Global Carbon Project, Rob Jackson, who's now at Stanford, uh, Jim Randerson, who's now at UC Irvine, Bruce Hungate, who's at Northern Arizona University, uh, Sarah Hobby, who's at University of Minnesota, Heather Reynolds, who's at Michigan State, I think. So we really had a chance to have a, a, a whole bunch of global change ecologists uh, get uh, projected out on their future careers as a result of uh, digging around in these Jasper Ridge soils. A final thing I want to mention is that uh, an important conclusion from this study was that when you study ecosystems in chambers, you get a lot of chamber effects. And they ranged from alteration of the wind speed and the water balance to the fact that in the chambers there was a vertical wind of about one foot per second caused by the injection of the, of the air mix into the chamber. And that was a wind speed that was sufficient such that the butterfly pollinators couldn't really uh, fly against it and the pollination biology was fundamentally altered by the wind and we really couldn't figure out any way to deal with it in a context that included chambers and that led to a lot of the features of the design of the next experiment. Uh, its key result from the, this experiment was this one published in the late 90s in Nature 
showing that if you contrast the high CO2 and ambient CO2 components of the process, there was an increase in um, plant growth, but mostly what you saw was an increase in the cycling of carbon through the system with a very small increment in the amount of carbon that stayed around as litter and soil accumulation. The, the lessons from that experiment led us to uh, create an even more ambitious experiment that was partly intended to get away from the chamber effects, but also intended to even more ambitiously recognize the complexity of the climate change challenge and to include an increasingly broad suite of factors in the analysis. And so the, the basic design was to incorporate not only elevated CO2, but also warming, alteration of the nitrogen cycle, and alteration of precipitation inputs. Uh, the project has gone on for nearly 20 years now, and every few years when we ran out of money, we, we had to re-envision the project around a different theme. Uh, we, oops, I'm sorry, started out with the theme of interacting global changes, switched to a, a theme of understanding the molecular biology of the individual components, uh, looking at species versus physiological effects, uh, the role of state changing species, and then finally uh, asking whether we could utilize the responses to climate change in ways that helped us restore damaged ecosystems. The picture of the layout of the plots, um, eight replications. One of the things we learned from our early experiments was that ecosystem responses to climate change tend to be so noisy that unless you have high levels of replication, it's really difficult to detect significant effects. Another advantage of the, of the small stature plants is that the individual study plots didn't need to be very large. The, uh, the basic treatments, as I said, were to have four interacting climate changes, uh, a warming, about one and a half C provided by infrared lamps, elevated CO2, more or less 700 ppm coming from um, free air enrichment with a CO2 cloud released over the plots. Um, Arnold and I were talking before about the variability in the CO2 enrichment you get. And, and one thing that's not very realistic about this is that the CO2 concentration is definitely jumping around. We had a, a, a nitrogen fertilization treatment where we added um, a significant slug of, of nitrate uh, with the idea that there are important potential interactions between the nitrogen and carbon cycle, and this kind of pried those open. And then a, a, a water treatment where we increase precipitation by 50%. The main motivation for the water treatment wasn't so much that we think it's going to rain more in California. As you probably know, the projections for California precipitation with continued warming are uh, more or less no change. But we were concerned about being able to interpret the warming signal and to separate that from a drying signal that's expected from uh, adding additional radiant energy to the plots. Uh, the, the Results I want to talk about involved a, a wide range of researchers, uh, many generations of graduate students, several generations of, of project leaders, and uh, an, an amazing amount of time spent hunching over these little plots and, and separating plants in the field. Uh, the, um, the Jasper Ridge setting is incredibly beautiful, but most of the people who worked at Jasper Ridge have this memory of, uh, of being hunched over a plot and, and, and having their field of view restricted to, to a few square centimeters of grasses that they're looking at. The, the first result that really kind of shook up our approach to thinking at Jasper Ridge was one that was published in Science you know, back on 15 years ago now. Uh, Rebecca Shaw was the lead author. And, and what we saw in the first several years of the experiment was uh, relatively little difference between overall plant growth at elevated and ambient CO2. In, until this 2000-2001 year in which overall elevated CO2 led to a, led to a decrease in plant growth. And when we, when we looked more carefully, what we saw was that elevated CO2 led to an increase in plant growth when it was applied by itself. And this had been kind of the standard result across lots and lots of CO2 experiments that had been done in lots of ecosystems. But when we combined the CO2 treatment with other treatments, here the warming, nitrogen, precipitation, or, or combinations, the, the more the growth was increased in the absence of the CO2, uh, the larger negative effect of CO2 we saw. 
it was essentially as if the plants that grew more and more in the absence of elevated CO2 were really at the limits of uh, the resources that were available to support growth. And even though elevated CO2 allowed a greater level of photosynthesis, it didn't allow a greater level of growth and it, in fact suppressed growth as probably as a result of some other resource, potentially something about nitrogen, more likely another mineral nutrient being increasingly limited. So that kind of uh, set us up to try and probe more deeply into the overall controls on plant growth, recognizing that increasingly we should be thinking about interactions among factors and how increasing availability of one resource could restrict availability of another. And we just last year uh, completed a, a publication that pulled together all of the plant growth information over the entire trajectory of the experiment. Kai Zhu, who I believe is, was here this week earlier, and some of you may have already heard, uh, led the work on, on this. Uh, Kai is a, is, a, is a wonderfully creative statistician, and he helped us think through a lot of the complicated issues in analyzing uh, this gigantic data set. And, and a number of striking features emerged. So this is a plot of um, total annual net primary production in black, above ground net primary production below ground at ambient and elevated conditions of um, uh, temperature precipitation, CO2, and nitrogen. And the, the basic responses are, as you can see here, uh, slightly curvilinear responses with, with warming and with precipitation. In fact, the precipitation response is, is importantly curvilinear, and I'll come back to that. Um, not much response of CO2, as we had already reported, and a, and a substantially positive response to increasing nitrogen concentration. Uh, Kai developed a, a beautiful mix effect model that allowed us to look at individual and interactive effects of each of the components of the NPP response. And what you can see is um, this is with standardized coefficients expressed in terms of uh, the, the change in the response parameter for a one standard deviation change in any of the uh, driver variables. And what you can see is that for, um, well, nitrogen, a, a strong positive effect. Uh, CO2 has um, a positive effect for the below ground, but a, a negative effect for the uh, a I'm sorry, a small positive effect for the above ground and a negative effect for the below ground. Uh, the the uh, curvilinear terms were for temperature negative on the below ground and, and pos uh, about zero on the above ground. And for water, we see these strongly um, negative second order effects. Uh, temperature, overall negative effect. And most of the interactive multi-factor effects weren't significant with a couple of exceptions, and I'll come back to those in a minute. One of the driving concepts in climate change research has been the expectation that there would be progressive effects. Whatever happened in year one would change the availability of nutrients or water or species composition that would alter the dynamics of the effect in year two, which would have further effect in year three, and on and on and on. And our expectation was that we would see these profoundly interactive, uh, progressive effects uh, with this experiment. And uh, one of the really important insights that Kai brought to the analysis was a demonstration that we weren't really seeing progressive effects. You could view each year as a separate realization of a new experiment where you were altering all these conditions. And in some ways, maybe it's not too surprising given the small magnitude of all of these individual effects. But one advantage of not having progressive effects is we had a much wider range of conditions that we had explored. And you can see that here. Uh, we had essentially looked at uh, annual average temperatures that spanned a range of, uh, of about 4C. Uh, we looked at precipitation levels that spanned a range from about 200 millimeters annual precipitation up to more than 1,200 millimeters. And a, and a very wide range of CO2 concentrations and, um, and nitrogen concentrations, nitrogen availabilities. And the, the um, really cool feature of this is that as a consequence, we can begin to construct, in fact, we, we can systematically construct the multidimensional response surfaces that are populated now by hundreds of observations rather than just the, the high low that's a characteristic of most ecosystem responses.
And in, in um, this complicated multidimensional plot, uh, what you're seeing is biomass going from uh, low to high as the colors go from blue to red and their, their isolines of equal biomass. And then the observations are plotted on those with the size of the circle indicating the observation. So if you see a, a big circle in a redder place, that means there's high agreement uh, between the modeled responses and the observations. If you see a, a big circle in a blue space, it means that we, we miss the boat. And in general, the model fit the observations really well. And the striking feature of this analysis wasn't so much the climate change sensitivity of the ecosystems, although it, it is generally true that um, as, the, as the temperature went up, especially at either low or high precipitation, you saw a, a decrease in primary production. It was how the, the responses to temperature and precipitation tended to have optima, uh, and that the optima were close to the average annual conditions at Jasper Ridge. The average annual conditions are shown by the crosses here, and the optimum conditions for plant growth are the, the centroids. And what you can see in the, um, in the, in the top, which is um, um, the, the plots that are at elevated nitrogen, and in the bottom at ambient nitrogen, is that in general, these, the, the, the crosses, the, the um, actual conditions tend to, be, tend to be close to the optima. And the other surprising thing about this is the extent to which in California grassland, the grassland we always think about as water limited, uh, there tends to be the consistent model and observed pattern of um, an optimal amount of precipitation and decreasing precipitation when it's drier, as you would expect, but also decreasing precipitation when it's wetter, which you wouldn't necessarily expect. And we spent a lot of time head scratching to say, well, you know, the whole, the, the essential reason you get grasslands is because they're dry and, and if you add more precipitation, you tend to get more productive grasslands and then some other kind of ecosystems. And, and what we have concluded, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along, is, is that there are some special features of the way Mediterranean grasslands work that do in fact make them uh, vulnerable to increases in precipitation. And there are some interesting interactions between the way that uh, climate change alters plant processes that tends to amplify the tendency to have higher precipitation result in lower plant growth. And let me talk a, a, a little bit about those. Um, one of the striking things is that we, we didn't, as we expected, see warming result in an increased drying. Um, Eric Zavaleta published papers back in the early 2000s showing that um, when we when we either uh, did warming or CO2, or both warming and CO2, we got an end of season increase in available soil moisture. That, that's not what you would expect. What you would expect is that with warming especially, uh, you'd be increasing the driving gradient for evaporation. You'd be increasing the soil temperature. And uh, if, if anything, driving more rapid use of water and a more rapid drying at the end of the growing season. With CO2, you expect elevated CO2 to result in stomatal closure and, and conservation of water. And, and with the CO2 response, you also saw an increase in, in moisture retention. But, but what turned out to be the explanation is important for the overall ecosystem responses. And that became clear in a paper that Elsa Cleland published in, in 2006. And it's that the, the plants basically got to be uh, confused about the timing of the season, and with warmer temperatures, they accelerated their growing such that they entered senescence before all the water was used up. And we ended up with the plants essentially leaving utilizable resources on the table in response to the warming signal in a way that made the growing season end too early. And it, it turns out that the, um, the most important driver of the reason that these ecosystems are suppressed by increase in concentration of CO2 or increased warming has to do with this phenological trickery. I, I want to uh, go through two other stories of, of factors that have been really important in controlling ecosystem outputs. 
And, and those mean that we need to transition to not thinking about overall ecosystem responses, but thinking about species by species responses. And, and one of the other advantages of the Jasper Ridge ecosystem is that based on either harvested or, or live material in the field, we can, we can sort them to species and ask whether the species composition is changing in ways that are important for ecosystem outcomes or for explaining some of these um, ecosystem processes. And, and the first story I want to tell you about is one that Halt and Peters led, it's published about 10 years ago, where, where he was trying to say, what are the factors that explain the observed changes in species composition from year to year? And um, he, he was interested in uh, differences in herbivory between uh, different species, and also whether herbivore choice depended on the treatments. And the, the generalist herbivore that he used was this, this gray garden slug, really, really common at Jasper Ridge and relatively easy to study. And um, was able to show that there were, there were big differences in um, the extent to which um, growth occurred with and without herbivores and was also able to show in cafeteria-style style experiments that the relative preference for the herbivores shifted dramatically among different functional groups of plants, uh, depending on how those plants had been grown. So what you can see here is that, for example, the, um, when the plants were grown with additional water, uh, there was an incredible consumption of the legume. But when they were grown under ambient conditions, the consumption focused on, the, on a grass. So uh, Halton developed a statistical model that allowed him to assess the relative implications of these shifts in herbivore preference for changes in the composition compared to changes in the, the physiology of photosynthesis and growth. And what he found is, is shown here, uh, where the observed composition shifts are shown in the open bars and the uh, predicted shifts are shown in the, in the slash bars. And in general, across all of the treatments, about 90% of the observed changes in abundance were explained by the shifting herbivore preference. And you didn't really need to know anything about changes in photosynthesis or growth, except that the attractiveness of each of these functional groups to the herbivores had shifted as a consequence of the changing leaf chemistry. Uh, really kind of alerted us to the importance of uh, herbivores as major system controllers and, and highlighted the extent to which if we really wanted to understand the way the ecosystem would unfold in the long term, we really needed to think about the herbivores. And um, that became even more important as we shifted our focus to state changing species and restoration. One of the restoration challenges that we've been most interested in addressing is, is yellow star thistle, which is incredibly abundant in California grasslands, super abundant at Jasper Ridge, and uh, based on a number of studies, just loves elevated CO2. Uh, here you can see the, the yellow star thistle shoot biomass in uh, elevated and ambient CO2, and uh, across all of these treatments, there was something like a 600% stimulation of uh, yellow star thistle biomass under elevated CO2. And one of the things that this, this really, in kind of horrifying ways, suggests is that climate change may be one of the factors that's really accelerating invasion of California grasslands by uh, yellow star thistle. Uh, but, it, but it was frustrating because when we looked at uh, features like relative photosynthesis, star thistle didn't seem to be more, more sensitive to CO2 than anything else. Um, but when you looked at the performance in the field, uh, Scott Laurie, who's now at the California Academy of Sciences, led, led the work on this one. Uh, what you saw was this uh, gigantic stimulation of shoot biomass by elevated CO2 compared to this tiny response in the, in the rest of the ecosystems. And, and across all of the treatments, there was this tendency for the yellow star thistle response to be much larger than that of the overall ecosystem. So we, we uh, really struggled for a long time to try and figure out what might be the features of the ecosystem dynamics that were allowing the star thistle to get these gigantic growth responses, even though the physiology didn't seem to be changing all that much. Uh, Marina Oster entered the picture 
trying to figure out whether it might be something about the defensive mechanisms that are used by the yellow star thistle. And uh, for those of you who are into plant-insect uh, interactions, you know that, or plant-animal interactions, I apologize, slugs are not insects. Uh, there's this amazing um, multi-trophic interaction that star thistle uses as a defense mechanism. Uh, the, the, the main herbivore is this, this same gray garden slug that Halton studied. And um, the gray garden slug is, is preyed upon by, uh, by, by beetles. Um, the, the gray garden slug is introduced from Europe. And there's an a introduced European beetle that's a, that's a major predator on it. And, and um, there's very clear evidence that many plants in this family release a chemical signal that's an attractant to the predator on the herbivore. So they're basically calling in the cavalry to defend themselves uh, against the, the herbivores. And uh, what Marina found uh, was that if you uh, compared damaged and undamaged yellow star, star thistle leaves, where you just scraped the leaves and said, um, does the beetle do you get that beetles are attracted to the damaged leaves in a, in a simple Y-tube experiment uh, for, the, for the California native beetle, the Scaphinotus, wasn't really a significant effect, but for the introduced beetle, the Peristichus, there's a really strong effect where the, the beetle cued on the um, volatile compounds that are released by the, by the star thistle and at least had the ability to use those chemicals to cue in on predation on the slugs. Marina spent a lot of work uh, assessing which chemicals were released as a result of the damage and also demonstrating that the, um, the increase in chemicals led to an increase in, in uh, the ability of the beetles to, to find the slugs. Uh, what, what she couldn't find is clear evidence that elevated CO2 somehow amped up this um, anti-herbivore defense mechanism. And what we think is probably happening is that uh, simply having more bigger star thistle allows them to be more effective in bringing in the, um, the um, predators on the herbivores. And a really striking thing, I don't know if any of you guys have tried to grow yellow star thistle. I, we may be the only people in the world who ever tried to grow. It, at Jasper Ridge, it's almost impossible to get yellow star thistle to grow unless you exclude the, the gray garden slugs because they're so effective as, as herbivores. And what we really think is happening is that it, somehow this interaction between the, the plant, the herbivore, and the predator on the herbivore is being altered uh, through the signaling mechanism that makes the plants more effective at, at calling in the herbivores. The, the, the next story I want to talk about kind of uh, helps us move beyond the, the scale of the, the square meter or so of the individual plots and begin to look at the, the more landscape scale consequences of the climate changes. Uh, we, we spent thousands of, uh, of person hours and, and millions of dollars setting up this experiment. And then a, a construction worker in 2003 knocked over a power pole that set a wildfire that swept through the experiment. And, uh, and it burned. Um, two of the eight replicates of everything. You can see the trace of the fire here. There's the power pole that got knocked over. And um, that's what the, what the plots look like after the, after the fire. And, and you know, fire is an important part of grassland ecosystem. So we said, is there some way we can, we can use these results to get some insight into the, the role of fire in ecosystem processes, especially as they interact with climate changes? And then uh, can we use that to help establish a broader context for these results? And following this 2003 wildfire, we did a, a, a whole bunch of studies that um, most convincingly demonstrated that the fire um, released the ecosystems to be more responsive to elevated CO2. And you can see that here uh, in the burn plots where the CO2 is, is leading to a, to a growth increase. And we also saw an um, indication that um, following the fire, there was a less tendency for the, for the plants to be phosphorus limited. And we think that the release of the phosphorus limitation was, was an important component of the fire response and also an important component of why the plants aren't very CO2 responsive. Wildfire is an important part of grasslands everywhere. So we finally got our act together to be able to do uh, 
a, a controlled wildfire. And in 2011, we did a, a controlled wildfire. And I'm going to show a, about a minute of video of what the fire looks like, because you would think these grasslands couldn't really burn in a way that was very um, impressive. But it, it's striking how, in, during the summertime, uh, they, they just go up in a puff. So a one minute or so of video. It's also impressive to look at the, at the level of control that the, this CAL FIRE uh, doing the fire, uh, the level of control they have. They wanted to run the fire up to this blue line on the, on the grass. And, and essentially, they, they could control within just a couple of centimeters where the fire started and where the fire stopped. And you can see there, they started with a drip torch here. Uh, the fire moves at a, at a pace of about a, a foot per second across the grassland. So each little piece of grassland is only on fire for, for five or 10 seconds. Uh, but, but once a significant area is burning, you really get a, something that feels like a big fire with, with flame lengths that are up to three or four meters. And you can see that the fire accelerates as the heat it's generating pulls in more and more air. It's really impressive how, how uh, much of a fire you can get out of so little biomass. <laughs> it's also impressive how pretty much uh, the, they, they were able to control the fire exactly at the blue lines they drew on the grassland. I think that's about Well, you can see how tall the flames are. Re really impressive fire and uh, a significant amount of, of, of nutrients that are released to, back to the system as a consequence of that. The, the, the big effect of the fire in terms of, uh, of what happens the next year is that you get a, a big boost in primary production. And, and there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, you can see here the, um, the proportional effects of the um, ecosystem responses both that we observed at Jasper Ridge and in a, in a um, recent review of um, meta-analysis across a whole bunch of studies. And you can see that in comparison to most studies, the Jasper Ridge response is a biomass in response to elevated CO2, above ground, uh, below ground, uh, are, are smaller than in other systems. Uh, our response to nitrogen is about the same, and our response to the two is, is, is much smaller. Uh, what's dramatic is, is when you add the fire responses, here from the natural fire in 2003 and the controlled burn in, in 2011, our, our, our system comes much closer in line with, with what's observed in the, uh, in the, in the meta-analysis and really suggesting again that, that what's important is to have the, uh, the release of, of nutrients that allow the, the ecosystem to respond to other factors. Uh, Aaron Strong did a, did a very nice study sort of trying to uh, pull together the, the way that fire in, influenced the ecosystem processes. And it was able to show that, that um, the, the nutrient availability made a big difference. But what his path analysis showed most interestingly and convincingly was that warmer soil temperatures seemed to be the main thing that was leading to stimulation of, of biomass. And the warmer soil temperatures you might think are because the soil is black as a result of the fire. But it wasn't really that. It was really that the sunlight was being directly absorbed at the soil surface and not up in a, in a plant and litter canopy. Uh, I, I want to show you one other interesting consequence of the fire. And to do that, I'm going to run quickly through a series of Google Earth photos of what the ecosystem looked like before and, and after each of the fires. This is starting uh, before the fire. Uh, you'll, you'll see outlined in red the, the plots that were burned. Uh, so here we have the, the burn plots. Uh, immediately after the fire. Uh, here you can see how, what they look like in, in Google Earth. Oops. And, uh, and here at the uh, now, and what's striking about the fire plots now, oops, I'm sorry, <laughs> got an autopilot, is that they don't have any shrubs. And the unburned plots all have baccarus invading, but the fire plots, independent of our studies, uh, don't have any shrubs. And I think that in, in the big picture scale, uh, that's what's really going to be important in, in changing the dynamics of these grasslands is, is whether the fire probability gets altered as a result of the, of the ecosystem changes and how that influences whether the grasslands stay as grasslands. Uh, I just want to do a, a couple of things to connect the Jasper Ridge results to what we're seeing big picture around the country and around the world uh, with a couple of recent uh, meta-analyses. Here you can see 
um, in, in the recent paper by Hopkins et al, uh, projections of uh, expected changes in grassland cover and aridity showing that the Jasper Ridge is a little bit of an extreme uh, being down at the low end of the responsiveness. And then a uh, really interesting recent paper by Andreessen et al that asked whether or not if you look at responses to all of the ecosystems that have been subjected to uh, global change experiments, CO2 warming, nitrogen additions, that you, you tended to see constant responses, um, responses that took a while to kick in, or responses that got to be stronger and stronger through time, responses that got weaker through time, or responses that went one direction and then went the other direction. And, and in response to both CO2 and warming, by far the most common response was this, um, whatever happened was constant. In this Andreessen et al. study, the, the overall CO2 response was substantially larger than we got. It was on the order of about 25% increase in NPP, uh, but it didn't change through time. The warming response was also a positive one, a little larger than ours. It was about 15%, but again, with no change through time. And if we contrast the results we saw at Jasper Ridge with those that are emerging at the global scale, what we really see is a, a Jasper Ridge and ecosystem that's in a really exquisite balance with the available level of resources, such that if you push the resources either higher or lower, you tend to see a little responsive growth, a little responsive growth by increasing nutrient availability and, and decreasing growth by either raising or lower temperature or raising or lowering precipitation. And, and overall, I think the most important themes that we've observed and the themes I want to leave you with are that the major controllers of things that happen in the ecosystem tend to be those that involve uh, species interactions like the controls on herbivory that we talked about and the con controls on the controls on the herbivory like the uh, predation on the slugs and also the disturbance dynamics. So I think we're, we're left with a, a system where we we understand a, a tremendous amount about the specifics of the global changes, but it's really hard to generalize because what you see here is that the details of the specific actors that are involved are really are the big controllers. And that's where I'm going to leave you. It's been a pleasure to give you a few minutes of tour of Jasper Ridge. Thanks so much. the main thing that's happening there is that in, in our ecosystems, the, um, well, let me say uh, a few more things about the way we did the precipitation treatment. So our precipitation treatments were every time it rained in the high precipitation treatment, we would add 50% more. And so the rainfall was during the rainy season. And at least at Jasper Ridge, as you get more and more rain, you're partitioning more and more of the rainfall toward runoff. And by the time you're at the highest precipitation levels, uh, you're essentially just increasing runoff and we think nutrient leaching at the same time. So by having the highest precipitation levels be 50% more than what was occurring during the wettest years, we, we really push the system kind of beyond the level at which the additional water was making any contribution to plant available water. And an, an interesting feature of this is if you compare our results with most of the California rainfall plant growth analyses of what happens in our experiment is that by having the precipitation added treatment, you're really moving outside the range that other people have looked at. And I think that the combination of moving outside the range and having the nature of the treatment being just increasing the magnitude of each precipitation event, it really um, showed us the evil side of, of, of increasing precipitation. I think, in, you know, your work and others have shown that in most places you do see a, a, the positive trend of increasing precipitation leading to increasing plant growth, as we see at low precipitation, and that in some settings you would expect increasing precipitation to 
be representative of a longer growing season, but because of the nature of the way we added the precipitation, we didn't have that. Uh huh. You mentioned you had serpentine and not serpentine soils. Was there any important difference in any of the responses you looked at? The, uh, the, we did the serpentine, non serpentine focus in the earlier experiments, the ones during the 90s. And, and the, really, uh, the dominant difference was the extent to which elevated CO2 allowed additional soil moisture that was stored uh, to lead to a stimulation of growth, especially of the late season annuals. And, and across all of our experiments, what we've tended to see is that late season annuals, star thistle is a good example, but with tarweeds we saw it as well, tended to be the things that were most stimulated. And the way, the way we think about it is that, you know, there's basically, a, a, for the late season annuals to be successful, they've got to get a taproot down into the depth range where there's soil moisture available over the summertime. And uh, if the soil dries out before they do that, they, they don't succeed. And that the CO2 played a critical role in, in allowing the tap roots to get into permanent soil moisture. And we saw that more consistently in the sandstone soil, which was you know, more resource rich and where the permanent soil moisture seemed to be easier to access than in the serpentine soil. Uh, I've got to follow up on that and just ask, what are the long-term patterns and treatment effects in either functional groups or species compositions? So we, we thought that this experimental design was going to be really ideally configured for looking at um, persistent changes in, in species. And that what, what we originally thought is that the changes in species composition would get to be more important through time and, and alter the responses. The, the fact that the biomass responses were relatively small meant that we weren't seeing these progressive effects in nutrient cycling. And I think the fact that the plots were relatively small meant that we didn't really see persistent effects of, um, of the changes in species composition, essentially a, a reset by seed and pollen flow every year. And we, um, we did see profound and important changes in species composition sort of experiment-wide, but they tend to be the species composition changes that were influencing the grassland as a whole. And in, in this ecosystem, the, by far the most striking one is the increase in the abundance of native perennial grasses. And as everybody knows, the California grassland mostly went from native perennials to introduced annuals with the arrival of, of, of Spanish ranching in the, in the 19th century. But with the removal of grazing, changes in the nitrogen cycle and potentially changes in CO2 and climate, we're really seeing this ecosystem transition back to being perennial dominated. And I don't know if people are seeing that in, in local ecosystems here, but, but it's quite striking at Jasper Ridge. Uh -huh. Ben. Chris, looking at the, uh, the fire effects over time, and I'm curious if the release from limitation allows for additional carbon uptake, you know, in the subsequent years, but what the difference is between no fire and fire boss in terms of total carbon storage, given that you might increase MPP, but you might lose carbon, but well, you're definitely losing carbon to the atmosphere. And then if there's any sort of like biochar feedbacks toward increasing soil carbon available, soil carbon pools available. Yeah. So have you guys looked at those kinds of things, like those questions? We, 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 have, we have tried to answer that question. And I should say that the, the fire effect on NPP is, is very concentrated in the first year following the fire. We don't see any NPP effect following that. And, um, and we have tried in a bunch of ways to ask whether there should be an overall alteration of um, carbon or nutrient stocks or trace gas fluxes. And, and the, the results have been mixed. Um, Audrey Nibier did some really nice studies on N2O flux and found that after the first fire, the accidental fire, that there was a significant stimulation of N2O loss following the fire, especially when it was combined with high CO2 or nitrogen. And her calculation was that the additional forcing of climate by the loss of N2O was the, the dominant uh, climate forcer as a result of the fire, not the, the carbon uptake. With the controlled burn that we did in 2011, we were not able to detect long-term changes in soil carbon or any nutrient pool as a result of the fire. Uh-huh. 
So the question is, um, do, do I still believe in the model ecosystem concept uh, now that what we've seen is that um, the important details play out in, in every ecosystem? And I, I, I'm, in, I'm into looking for general patterns. And the general pattern that we found from Jasper Ridge is that you need to be alert to the unexpected drivers and that you would not want to use a, a standard CO2 uh, carbon cycle model. And, and I, I think that when, when I communicate about risks of climate change impacts, the idea that there are going to be surprises and that local details matter is, is a very general response. And I'm comfortable with that being an important lesson from the, uh, from the model ecosystems. Uh -huh. I wasn't sure from the, from the really interesting remember results that you described whether that was more of a potential effect that you can find when slugs are present or whether there are enough slugs present or other herbivores present in the system that those effects will happen. In other words, do you need to put a slug there or are there ambient, <laughs> ambient slugs? Yeah, well, that's, really, that's, a, that's really hard to... <laughs> be sure about. What I, what I can say, and the reason I asked who's tried to grow yellow truck thistle, it's really hard to get yellow truck thistle to grow because the slugs always get it. But then it's taken over the world and so how do you, how do you reconcile the fact that I, I can't grow a single truck thistle without a banana slug getting or without a gray garden slug getting it. And they're, they're really, really abundant. And uh, the, the, uh, my working hypothesis is that this defensive mechanism seems to be sufficient to get the populations going. And it, it seems to me that a, a likely uh, way it's modulated is that when you have a higher concentration of either slugs or of star thistle, you, you do a better job of attracting the predators. And so. Yeah, it's by far the, the dominant herbivores we think are these gray garden slugs. And they're, they're important, I think, not only in the amount of biomass they consume, but in the time of the year they do the consumption. And the garden slugs are active as things are germinating, where you know, one or two healthy slug bites is the difference between life and death for a little plant. And um, as Halton's work showed, they, they really have a big influence on the community composition. And, and there are lots and lots of them during this time of the year. Uh, I, I think I mentioned that the yellow star thistle is an, is an introduced invasive, and it's interesting that the whole tripartite system runs on, on introduced species, so that we, we had a problem because of the introduced species, but the hope for controlling comes from the in, introduced slug, but then the problem with controlling the slug is that the introduced beetle is preventing it from doing its job. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And the, the, the garden slugs are abundant basically during December, January when it is super cold and wet and fire is an issue during the summertime when it's hot and dry. I, I don't actually know where the garden slugs are during that time, but they're not out there uh, eating stuff. <laughs> Does anybody know where the garden slugs are at that time? Somewhere where the fire doesn't get them. Thank you so much. Pleasure talking to all of you.